We Presbyterians have long held on to the notion that when a crowd gathers, it's time to eat. <laughs> As the old story goes, an elementary school teacher was discussing various religions and asked the children to bring in items that would be symbolic of their faith to share with the class. And so a little girl came up and brought a crucifix, and then a Jewish boy stood up and brought a menorah, and then an Islamic lad had a prayer rug that he would show, and then the Presbyterian in the group brought out a casserole dish. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that uh, the thing that drew me to the Presbyterian Church as a child was potluck suppers <laughs> because food has always been a central part of life in the church and in human existence because food is necessary for that existence itself. And in this day and age, food is clearly a sign of love. If you had a bad day in third grade, milk and cookies always seem to make you feel better. Just think about how many commercials exist that show people happily eating, whether it's at McDonald's or at the breakfast table, you know, let go my ego, or at a Thanksgiving feast. It's all about food. In fact, I think I find it interesting that so many commercials about dieting talk about all the food you can eat <laughs> while you're on that particular diet. Yeah, it's no wonder that obesity, obesity is a problem for our society. And what's even harder for us to understand is the fact that food scarcity has been a major truth through most of human history and is still a factor in many places in our world. None of us living today can really remember a time when starvation played a role in our own lives. Some might remember the scarcity of food during the Great Depression or the food shortages during World War II, but Starvation is something we only see on perhaps the African continent or often due to the fact that there's a political situation that causes hunger rather than an actual famine. Not having enough to eat just isn't one of our concerns. In fact, we throw away more food as Americans on a weekly basis than most of the world consumes all throughout history. On a yearly basis, that's part of our lives. And yet, it's that fact that brings us to this morning's scripture lesson. All the more powerful because it's a trying time for Jesus as we approach the passage. As I said, John has just been beheaded. And Jesus finds that uh, it's amazing that Herod has acted on the request of his stepdaughter, to do that, not even a religious or political reason. And so Jesus has retreated to a deserted place to have some time for himself to deal with what with has happened. But people soon discover that he's there and they make their way out to him. And Jesus sees the crowd and feels this compassion for them. And so he begins healing the sick. And it goes on all day long and into the evening. And now darkness was beginning to set in and the disciples want Jesus to dismiss the crowd so that they can go and find some food in the neighboring towns trying to get something to eat. And Jesus tells the disciples that they don't have to go. The disciples should give them something to eat. Jesus, we've only got five loaves of bread and a couple of fish. That's hardly enough for us to feed this crowd. But Jesus says, bring them to me, and they do. And he looks up to heaven and prays, and then he breaks the bread. It's amazing. The disciples are instructed to give the food to the crowds after being seated, and everyone there, all 5,000 men and the women and children who were there, all ate, and as the King James reiterates, all were satisfied. Not only is everybody fed, but we discover that they can bring back 12 baskets full of broken bread. And so here we have the story of the feeding of the 5,000. A miracle in itself, but we have more than that. We have Jesus breaking bread and filling the needs of these spiritually hungry individuals. We have a foreshadowing 
of what we will, do, we, we will be doing in the next few minutes. You know, the church has been feeding millions of individuals with the bread of life down through the centuries, breaking bread as Jesus did, sustaining life in all sorts of situations, granting hope and healing to those who would gather at the feet of Jesus. And yet it all begins with the feeding of the 5,000. I find myself realizing that as Trinity prepares for the arrival of a newly installed pastor, you as a congregation need to remember that the call to you is to respond to the one who says, feed my sheep. And that feeding begins not in Fellowship Hall and the kitchen, but right here at this table. Will you join me in prayer? Eternal God, as we think about coming to your table, we recognize that we become part of that crowd of 5,000 and 5 million and tens of millions of people who gather to share your body and blood. We discover the power that you have given us to feed others, and we seek to do that in a very practical way. But we need to remember we also do it in a very spiritual way. So we ask, O oh God, that you would prepare our hearts and minds and souls to receive the gifts of your body and blood that we might experience your presence and grace and so help to feed the rest of the world in so many ways. Through Jesus Christ we pray. Amen.